Glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Alleluia. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has shared with me about his perception of the current church, the church today. And he feels like there is much that is lacking. And as I was meditating upon the book of Malachi, the Lord, I believe, spoke very clearly to me in my heart. And he told me, there is nothing new under heaven. What happened before is happening now and will happen again in the future. Nothing is new under the heavens. And he reminded me how in Malachi, the priests who had been established as those at whose mouth the word was going to be found, they were given that responsibility while well, they had failed in that role. Even though they had been established there, even though they had received the headship concerning the law and providing it to the people who were to find it at their mouth, they strayed from that role. They did not take it seriously. The Lord even says in the Bible that they snuffed at it. They considered it was wary, wearisome to take care of the things of the temple. And so, they offered meat that was contemptible at the Lord's table. And when the Lord reproached them, they said, How do we make the table of the Lord contemptible? You offer polluted meat on my altar. And the Lord was reminding me that those priests, having been established in a position of authority concerning the law, on the one hand did not execute a proper service in the temple, offering improper sacrifice, but on the flip side, they were leading people astray. And they had relinquished the power, the authority that was given them. And the Lord told me, do you not see that it is the same today? I have established saints in a certain position. They're supposed to be the light of the world. But look at them on the same two fronts. In terms of the sacrifice that they are making, I'm no longer looking for the sacrifice of bulls and goats, granted. But I do say that my delight is a broken and a contrite spirit. I do say, offer yourselves up as a proper sacrifice to the Lord by giving up your own life in this world. And there's an image here of you being offered a sacrifice. But what kind of sacrifice are you? Remember in Haggai, the Lord is asking the people, if something holy touches something unholy, will it be holy still? And the priests answered and said, it will not be holy. And so we have to understand that what is offered in sacrifice has to remain pure. And this in turn connects to the fact that we are told not to love the world, neither the things of this world, because we have been offered a bride, chaste, a virgin and clean bride with a white robe. That's how we've been offered to the Lord, pure and clean, washed. Our garment has been washed, and therefore we cannot touch the unclean things lest we become unpure and be considered those who go back to wallow in the mire and are filthy again. We cannot go back to the things of the world after that we have renounced them. And the Lord was using that image. So on the one hand there was that aspect of being clean, and that touched on the service of the priests in Malachi who had to offer proper sacrifice and not pollute the Lord's table. What sacrifice are you offering yourself up to the Lord? Are you clean from the things of this world? And if you touch the unclean thing, then how are you clean? And so that's the first aspect, being clean, being pure and remaining in sanctification. What type of sacrifice are you? As the priests were offering polluted bread, on the Lord's table in Malachi. And we saw in Haggai that when something pure touches something unclean, it becomes unclean. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now the second aspect now of priests having been given a position of authority and not living up to the standard of that position, that's the saint who is supposed to be a light bearer and a light unto the heathen. But if you are not living a consecrated life, then you are risking falling into being lukewarm and your light is dim and you become empty. You're not being nourished 
by the spiritual meat of the Lord, by the will of the Lord, by the things of the Spirit, then you become like an empty vessel. There is a sentiment of being empty. And the Lord taught me about that in correlation with the priests who were supposed to be filled with the knowledge of the law but became empty about it and then the people were led astray because they did not have teachers who were filled with that knowledge that the Lord gives. Indeed, today we see that there are a lot of people who proclaim themselves to be teachers or establish themselves in different positions. But then we realize that they are unable to manifest any type of power spoken of in the Bible concerning the power that we receive with the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that on the one hand we must look for the fruits of the Spirit spoken of in Galatians 5.22, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, love, and such. But there are also gifts that come with the Holy Spirit. Gifts that can allow us to demonstrate the power of the gospel according to what Paul is telling us we should be able to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. Because the gospel is not about the excellency of speech, but about the demonstration of the power. And this is why signs accompany those who have believed. And so the Lord confirmed his gospel with signs. But we have leaders now a lot of them online, preaching against the power of the gospel, contrary to what the Bible is telling us that we have received power with the Spirit, and God is not a man to lie. And then we realize that they are lying about the power that lies in the Holy Spirit because they're not able to manifest it, and they would want to justify their own position where they have established themselves in that position, but do not manifest the power that they are supposed to be accompanied by. And therefore, they preach against the word to justify themselves being in their position without any manifestation of power. Now, if Simon the sorcerer, by tapping into demonic power, was able to make himself a great one before the people of Samaria, how much more can the man of God, the true man of God, tapping into godly power, how much more can he manifest the power of the Almighty God? having his spirit. And so, today, the Lord is telling me that he is not happy about these so-called masters, teachers, preachers who preach against the power of the gospel to justify the fact that they are not able to manifest it. Because the inheritance that the Lord has given us, it has a component of power. It comprises true power that we have received and that we have been told that we have received very clearly we have received authority and power, and yet some so-called leaders would want to tell us that that's not true, because they're trying to justify the fact again that they're not able to manifest it. Now it's important that we remember that in John chapter 1 verse 6, it is written that there was a man sent by God, and his name was John. Now he was sent by God, and so he had the anointing of the Lord. But if some people establish themselves in a position without having been sent by God, they don't have the anointing for that role. And this is how they become without fruit in that position that they have established themselves and cannot manifest the power of the Holy Spirit and then justify themselves publicly by saying, in fact, I'm not supposed to have any power. And that is not biblical. So, brothers and sisters, if I review what I've said thus far, I've spoken of the priests in Malachi, that on the one hand they offer polluted sacrifice, and that we have to be careful to offer ourselves up as a proper sacrifice, not tainted with the things of this world. And also they were put in a position of authority as the people in whose mouth the law should be found. And we are the saints, we are the church, we are the ones to whom the world should look to find the law. And that's an image to say to find the light of the gospel. But yet, if we are lukewarm and tend to be worldly, then even the world looking at us will blaspheme the name of the Lord, thinking that this so-called power that we have received 
is not able to have us walking in holiness and sanctification. And so the name of the Lord can be blasphemed by the heathen because of the saints if they become lukewarm and if they become empty of the truth and the light that they are supposed to be full of. And so we have to be careful not to be contaminated with the things of this world, just as certain holy things should not be in contact with unholy things. This is why the Lord reminded us, be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Alleluia. Now the other aspect now concerning being empty or full is the following. The Lord was explaining to me that in the beginning, when he created the world, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and then the Lord had to create light, and he sent light, and he was teaching me that light is the positive element, and he made an analogy between darkness being cold and light being hot. We know from science that it is the warmth, something hot, that gives its heat to a cold or colder object, and not the opposite. Cold is not transferred from a body to another, but rather heat travels from one body to another. Until these two bodies in contact one with another will have the same temperature. And so light is that positive element. And because it is that positive element, it fills the environment of darkness. And it excels it. Likewise, the Lord was telling me that we as lights, lights of the world, when we become tainted with the things of this world, our light is dim. And we tend to become empty and lean towards darkness, towards something dark. And being in such a state of emptiness we then lose our ability to be lights of the world. It is akin to saying that we lose our flavor as salt. When we lose our light, we lose our heat, we're no longer hot. But being lukewarm, it's as though we're being cold. Because the heat that we have, it is dissipating, and now we're becoming cold. And concerning also the aspect of being empty versus full, the Lord directed me to Jude, where we speak in Jude of clouds without water, carried about of strong winds. And the image here is that the clouds without water, they are like saints without fruit. Because the cloud is supposed, according to the Bible, to be full of water, to then pour it on the earth. And so the cloud carries water, and when it's full, it pours over the water on the earth. But a cloud without water is like a tree without fruit. It does not carry out the purpose for which it exists. And that cloud is carried about with the wind, like a saint can be carried about by all winds of different doctrines, false doctrines, if he is not filled with the light, with the truth, with the knowledge that is associated with the position at which he has been elevated. And that's an image that we have in Jude, clouds without water. Saints have to be careful not to be without the heat, not to be without the light, without the truth, or else they can't pour it into the world, into the world of darkness. The positive element that they have of heat, of truth, of light, they can't pour it into the cold world, which needs to receive it from them. It's not the other way around. It's not the darkness that has to come to you. That's not natural. It's not the cold that has to be transferred to you. That's not natural. You're the heat you're supposed to transfer unto the darkness. That's why light excelleth darkness in any case. Now, we also read in Jude that these trees without fruit, they are plucked up by the roots. They are twice dead. Now, this connects to the second death. You see, the first death is physical. The spirit is separated from the body, but the second death is when the soul itself, the spirit, is sentenced to eternal separation from God in a definitive manner and cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And therefore, we realize that these trees plucked up by the roots, twice dead, it is as though they have reached a point of no return. The second death even has been declared and pronounced unto them. This is like the fig tree that had no fruit, and Jesus said that it should wither, and it withered because it carried no fruit. 
You see, there was a first death for that tree where it stopped producing fruit or did not produce fruit at the opportune moment. That was the first death. And then Jesus condemned it eternally and had it wither away forever. That was the second death. Twice dead, plucked up by the root. Now the saint has to be careful that he carry fruit, that he be not empty of the light of the truth of the heat, so that this can be transferred into the darkness, into the cold world. Amen. Because that's the direction in which such things should flow. And also we have raging waves of the sea. Raging waves of the sea is talking about agitation, being agitated, being in a state of excitement. But that excitement is vain because there is a covenant between the sea and the earth that the sea will not pass a certain point beyond the shore. And there is an eternal covenant about this. So what does it mean? You may get excited. You may deal with the gospel in a way that excites the flesh. A lot of moving around, a lot of screaming, raging waves. But these waves, though they trash these waves, they can't get past a certain point. And so saints have to be careful not to fall into entertainment. Saints have to be careful not to fall into excitement of the flesh. Saints have to be careful not to be thinking that they're serving the Lord because they're moving about a lot, like Martha was while Mary abode at the feet of the Lord. Raging waves move a lot, but are they efficient? Does the fact that they are raging give them an advantage? Or is it not energy spent in vain? Mary hath chosen the good part, and it will not be taken away from her. Raging waves, saints in excitement. But where is the truth? Where is the will of the Lord for them? That perhaps they may be at the feet of the Lord to worship Him properly. And so we have to be careful when we look at Jude to bear fruit, else we are plucked up by the roots and twice dead. Not only fruitless, and deemed to be dead, but condemned, because we are twice dead, condemned according even to the second death. And we've been disqualified, spiritually, forever, and there's no turning back. Or, it may be that we're clouds without water, meaning we're empty, empty of light, empty of truth, empty of good works, about which we have to be zealous. Or we can be raging waves, filled with excitement and movement, and screaming and yelling. But it may be we're expected to be at the feet of the Lord, and that we're exciting the flesh, but not operating in the spirit. What catches the eye is not always what is pleasant to the Lord, and what the, and what the spirit is commanding. So there you have it, brothers and sisters. Keep yourself a clean sacrifice with a white robe for the Lord as a chaste virgin, as a chaste pure virgin, having your garment clean and washed, lest ye be an offering that is tainted by something unholy, something of the world. Give a proper service, a man that's the image, and assume the position of headship as the priests had to do in Malachi, assume the position of headship where you have the law, you have the gospel at your mouth to give to the heathen, to the nations. Amen. Because if you're empty of these things, then you are coming up short concerning your mission in this world as a soldier who is a servant of the Lord. Because you are entangled with the affairs of this world, or perhaps you are loving the things of this world when you are not to love them. And when you are empty like this, you are like a cold body, deprived of heat. Yet are you supposed to be that hot body communicating heat, truth, and life to the world that is cold and in darkness. And when you're empty this way, you're like a cloud without water. You are like a tree that doesn't bear fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root, and though you think of yourself as working hard, a raging wave, it may be that you are actually thinking this in your own mind, being excited in the flesh, raging, 
but the end result is you never get past the shore because you always stall at the shoreline and you're not able to continue walking on the narrow path on the shore beyond the shoreline because you're still bound to the things of this world as the sea is bound by a covenant eternal that it cannot go past a certain point on the seashore. Oh, magnificent is our Lord. Magnificent is our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you. Blessed be the name of Yehoshua HaMashiach. Blessed be the Almighty King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our beloved Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Amen.